we uh, it's sometimes difficult to get field all the questions from the participants. As you can see, there are many who are on here. So you must have been given a, a Google Sheet link uh, by Santosh, or he will give you at the end of the day. So what we we encourage the participants to type in any questions they could not ask during the lecture there. So that in the following day, the instructor can look at those and then address them in bulk and or in whatever way you prefer. Yeah, I, I will. I'm just going to readjust a bit the right, sure. uh, uh, the screen size and so on, so that I can see all the windows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this should work. Mm. Just uh, see, uh, the resolution is fine, right? Yeah, it, it, it is fine. Can I go oh. to the next slide so that we can see all the slide after that? Because this is a picture. The resolution, yeah. I can see the, the text. It's okay. The text is not broken or anything. No, the last line. Broken. This is fine, yes. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Then... Uh, should, should, should I wait for a minute or and uh, I think you can uh, feel free to start whenever you want. And uh, regarding the questions, uh, so we just wanted to let you know that we can either take all the questions at the end, or you can also give a pause in between and take field questions. So, uh, are, is somebody helping you, Sanjit? Uh, any student or postdoc? Uh, no, I think uh, I I can I can manage. Right. Uh, so the thing is that I, I so what I'm trying to do is mm -hmm. to keep the chat window also open. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so I now I can see all the windows together. I have a presentation right. and uh, the chat window. Okay. So now, uh, if anyone wants to ask questions, they feel free to. Uh, so they are they have permission to write in the chat box. They have permission to write in the chat box, but they cannot unmute themselves. So you being the co-host, you have to sort of unmute any person you want to have a dialogue with, and uh, yeah, and then they can ask the questions directly, or you can just read out the questions from the chat, whatever you prefer. Correct. That is uh, so that that I can uh, do. Okay. okay. Let me. Fine, I'll fine. also keep the participants window open so right. that I can. So in case someone raises the hand, they can. Uh, yeah. So I think best is to. Okay. Fine. I I think I can uh, manage both. Yeah. I can see all the windows, so it should be okay. Right. Um, yeah. I should be able to do it. No problem. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think I get started. Uh, yes, yes, please go ahead. Or, Thank you. No, I, I think everybody's here, so you can feel free to start when you want. Okay. All right. So uh, I guess uh, you. Uh, uh, okay, so this is the problem with uh, Zoom that I cannot see you. I just briefly saw your uh, faces, but then I think uh, now. Uh, I'll have to assume that you can, you are nodding or something. So the thing is that I, I uh, but then you can always uh, uh, stop me by si sending a message on the chat box. I sent you just uh, uh, one thing, sorry for uh, interrupting. Yeah, yeah, sure. uh, are, have you kept your video turned off for? Uh, I, for I did keep, okay. uh, but then I can turn it on also. Uh, I, I don't know how the, how the bandwidth is going to work with the no, I just I just wanted uh, to okay. notify that your video is off. If it's for a reason, then please go ahead. Uh, I, I think uh, if if the uh, so I I, didn't, I will turn it off so that uh, uh, because when the video, video is on the participants may find it difficult uh, sometimes with the bandwidth meaning the voice starts breaking but uh, uh, but I can also keep it off so I can keep it off on whatever like I mean I, I can completely up to you that is probably better yeah, sorry for interrupting yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, so I think in the morning you had a, a, a broad overview of gravitational wave lecture. Now mm, we will now have three lectures uh, on gravitational waves and LIGO India. Uh, so the idea is to is that so as you could have guessed already that it is uh, gravitational waves uh, a full course takes quite a bit of time. First, you have to uh, go through a general relativity course, which I'm sure many of you have not gone, uh, have not done yet in your formal uh, 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 coursework. I think many of you are BSc students, so you some of you may not even have a uh, special relativity course. So, but on the other hand, 
the broad overview can still be you would be able to appreciate without getting into the full mathematical and technical details which is our task here and also sort of basic main primary idea is to give you a flavor of the subject that that that's the main goal it's exactly how things work etc will take uh, years uh, i think it will take years because i am still trying to figure out many things and i have been working for more than 10 years so it can take pretty long time smarter people can probably uh, catch up faster but what i will do is that i will try to expand the lecture you heard in the morning even further so this will be a, a next step and then you can um, uh, if you have questions on specific topics then you can ask and then i can try to uh, explain the first thing before i start is to understand that completing the full lecture these these three lectures etc is not the main thing i think your pr primary goal should be to take home something out of these lectures so if you have questions about something specific feel free to ask there is no problem because you already have gotten an overview so that that part is anyway covered and now it will be little more details on based on uh, that so uh, so best is to ask questions whenever you want okay so the our journey okay so there will be some repetitions but i think that should be okay to uh, to uh, to uh, recall our journey started a long time ago probably uh, in 1960s um which i will tell you later that how exactly the 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 detection of uh, the activity to detect gravitational waves started in that those years but the major milestone or sort of what people call the birth of uh, gravitational wave astronomy uh, is kind of related to the first detection of gravitational first direct detection of gravitational waves where two black holes in spiral merged and then finally settled down after a uh, ring down phase forming a uh, bigger black hole and these many of you have seen in newspapers uh now uh, so uh, there, there are there is already a question but i will i will come to that little later um so the what you see here is that the there are two signals this red and blue which were received in the in two detectors which were 3000 kilometers away and all possibilities of different checks were done to see whether noise could create such a signal but creating the same signals at the same time 3000 kilometers away is uh, had extremely low probability the probability of such a thing happening accidentally was one part in 65000 years and hence it was uh, the first detection and but then after the words there are uh, now 50 detections and uh, it, the the whole field of uh, uh, gravitational wave astronomy is now uh, uh, fully established and we are looking forward to uh, more interesting things uh, so the uh, these three gentlemen got the nobel prize in physics in 2017 rainer weiss barry barish and keith thorn uh for the uh, discovery of gravitational waves uh the the whole work the whole uh, effort was uh, carried out by 1000 uh, people across the globe and you can see it's a remarkable piece of uh, international collaboration people were from different various countries and there were significant uh, contribution from india in various aspects of modeling the signals detecting uh, a very slow amplitude signal in noisy data and uh, also some of the uh, instrumentation uh, aspects some of which will uh, become clearer as we go along now the point is that this uh, whole thing created quite a bit of 
uh, excitement uh, um, in the not only the astronomy community but overall uh, among uh, even outside the scientific community overall in the uh, uh, whole population of the world i mean these things came on uh, headlines uh, came as headlines on a newspaper so there must be something important why a new field of astronomy becomes uh, why people celebrated it so much so to see that we'll just have few slides in the beginning about the motivation for doing uh, astronomy so human beings have been doing uh, astronomy for a long time uh, see, because the the sky was always there open i mean these days after we progressed it became difficult to see the sky from the cities uh, but uh, in those days it was very easy to uh, uh, see the sky and it was kind of na nature's uh, own lab uh, to study science but then people were sort of uh, using their eyes uh, to see to observe so the um, the reach was limited and also the the calculations which people did were using pen and paper which also limits sort of how my how far you can go uh, uh, then the the first major uh, breakthrough and it is sort of you, one could arguably say that this is the birth of observational astronomy um, was done by galileo when he uh, brought the bleeding edge technology of his time that uh, a astronomical uh, basically a telescope uh, which were uh, which was uh, uh, developed at that time and that was one of the latest instrument uh, he brought it in the in astronomy for uh, observations now um, so he basically uh, observed the phases of venus which kind of showed that the proved that venus is going round the uh, earth uh, around the sun and that kind of uh, gave a very strong um, proof that probably the planets are indeed going around the sun and not around the earth and it was an observational proof i mean today of course we uh, it uh, uh, feels trivial to believe that such a thing could be there that people are debating whether the uh, sun is going around the earth and so on but uh, but there are still many things which happen later on which i will tell you in a moment uh, to see that how uh, observations dramatically change our uh, perception uh, the way we understand the uh, universe today no no one uh, uh, debates about uh, these things of course there are some people still they, they debate about uh, these things and they believe that the earth is flat and so on but apart from uh, those are anomalies generally don't nobody uh, questions uh, this anymore so uh, that was more than 400 years ago and then uh, the the observation galileo's observation was done in um, in the optical uh, in the in the visible uh, band and but the electromagnetic spectrum has several frequencies and uh, there is astronomical information available in every part of it so uh, in the in the next 400 years we progressed significantly along that those lines and then this was the galileo telescope and then we have this state of the art uh, uh, telescopes observatories in different uh, bands so these are the uh, keck telescopes this is hubble space telescope these are in the sort of near infrared optical this is uh, gmrt uh, in radio this is a large wavelength and then this is the uh chandra x ray observatory this is in x rays and in a smaller wavelengths and this is swift gamma ray burst and this is cosmic uh, this plank uh, the cosmic uh, microwave background uh, uh, observatory which is, is again in the lower frequency so all over the frequency bands we have uh, uh, telescopes uh, now now why am i showing all this the point here okay we will become it will become clearer let me just complete this theory and then i will i'll come back to it Uh, the point is that we are kind of here sort of in in the, in the first detection phase and we have a very long way to go we'll come there now what did we learn from astronomy of course we got an extremely 
high resolution picture of the universe at this point i mean the, the nearer uh, objects are uh, very well understood and you know this this is at some point we were debating about whether the sun is at the center of the earth and now we have this Uh, extremely high resolution picture of the solar is uh, that precise picture of the solar system you know where things are this is the galaxy is a picture of a galaxy of course you know that but then i will i will tell you little bit more about this and you can see such a high resolution picture of this galaxy with uh, with modern uh, telescopes is the uh, uh, sts sloan digital sky survey picture showing that the universe is sort of uh, uh, homogeneous and isotropic statistically uh you will learn many of the, about many of these in your uh, summer uh, in this uh, lecture series okay this a uh, crab nebula gravitational lens and all these things you will learn but then apart from getting this very high resolution picture of this universe there were dramatic changes that also uh, were brought by astronomy there are objects like pulsars which were not even expected when the first detection happened that uh, jocelyn bell and her colleagues uh, found this small uh, 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 periodic signal coming from one uh, direction on the sky they first thought maybe these are uh, aliens sending uh, signals to us because these object pulsars there will be lot of uh, there there will be lectures on this people did not even expect then there are still many things which are not explained i mean there are this huge jets which are coming out of uh, active galaxies people don't know exactly how they work yet then uh, this is the cosmic microwave background you will know about it that there are this is a 70 percent peters discovery and uh, people did not know from where this noise is is coming from everywhere on on the sky uh, to the extent that penzias and wilson when they discovered this they started killing uh, cleaning the uh, the their telescope thinking that maybe this noise is uh, caused by uh, uh, pigeon droppings and so on and then this is another uh, piece of work which got a nobel prize uh, this is uh, accelerate uh, by measuring the acceleration of the universe but even before acceleration the that the that the universe is expanding was also a, a big dis discovery so now i mean just uh, so the point here is that once a field of astronomy starts all kinds of things start happening and then the the whole perception changes so dramatically you see that this is uh, i i told you about this uh, the, the galaxy that uh, that when you that today we see this high resolution picture of the galaxy and we find it cool but the thing is that this 1920 people were debating whether milky way is the whole universe and whether there are and then there is other set of people who are thinking that no maybe there are other galaxies outside the milky way so this was the kind of our understanding less than it is about not less than about 100 years ago 1920 it sorted out at some point so then einstein himself was refusing to believe that the universe is uh, could be expanding so all kinds of these things are there and this is why the when gravitational wave astronomy started people were so excited because there was a hope that many such new uh, uh paradigm shifts will happen in our understanding of astronomy okay now we will start with the with some basics of general relativity and so on uh, before that uh, of course the first part was kind of uh, motivational but if you have any questions i can pause here and uh, take the questions you can either raise your hand or uh, write in the chat box okay we will now move forward so uh, i think you were in the previous lecture you have learned that uh, you know newton's laws of uh, uh, gravitation along with newton's laws of motion gave us a very good uh, very precise uh, theory of gravitation in the sense that we could predict when we are going to see the uh, when and where we are going to see a planet 
when the next eclipse is going to happen and all kinds of uh, things could be uh, explained with uh, uh, Newton's laws, basically Kepler's laws of motion and so on, all these things together. And also Newton's laws uh, told us that the reason why the moon is going around the uh, earth is the same reason why an apple is falling on the earth. And all those things were kind of unified. But then there were some uh, shortcomings, I mean, in, in Newton's laws. I mean, they, they, they did not matter in our normal, real, uh, this kind of observations, but conceptually those were there. Uh, and in the same time, before that, in early 1900s, uh, even in Newton's laws, there were some problems which were found, conceptual issues, and then that led to uh, special relativity. We will not get into that. But then uh, Einstein started thinking that maybe we should have a relativistic theory of gravitation. The reason is that, that there is a problem of causality in uh, Newton's laws. If two objects are far away, the force between them is given by this g m1 m2 by r square, which does not have any time component. So if one object disappears, something happens to the object. Uh, let's say that that object was made of uh, matter and antimatter, and suddenly you, you uh, open some gate and then they formed light and they became massless. The other one, we immediately understand that. Or maybe let's say there was an explosion in one of them. The, now, that the uh, problem there is that that information that something has happened in one, according to Newton's laws uh, of gravitation, could uh, propagate at infinite speed to the other object. And that sort of violates the principle of relativity, which says that information cannot travel at a speed more than the uh, speed of light in vacuum. So, uh, and then there are there, there are many other uh, problems which Einstein uh, came up with with using thought experiments that uh, effectively the gravitation is uh, so, uh, can be mimicked by let's say an elevator, an accelerated frame, basically an elevator which is accelerating upwards give you the same feeling as gravity when you are inside. And then um, if you shine a laser light, what is going to happen to it? Is it going to bend or it is not going to bend? Now, if there is an observer who is outside the elevator, who is completely inertial, not accelerator or anything in, in space, either that person will see the light going straight or the person inside the elevator will see it is going straight. But either way, one, one person will have to see that the light is bending. Now, obviously, the person who is uh, outside in free space, most uh, there is no reason for that person to see the light is bending. So in that case, the person who is inside the elevator, that is under this virtual gravitational field, because the accelerated uh, uh, elevator uh, mimics gravitational field should see a, a bending and then that, that is that would also imply that probably gravitation should uh, bend light. So there are these thought experiments and uh, different things are there. You know, if you learn gravity, uh, general relativity later on, you will see all those uh, in the, uh, things in, your, uh, in the course. So it, it finally, Einstein came up with a uh, uh, theory, uh, which is called general theory of relativity, which is a relativistic theory of gravitation. And so far, all the experimental tests that have been done, general relativity has uh, passed those. So it is still uncontested theory of gravitation. There are other theories uh, people have proposed, but Einstein, but general relativity has passed all the tests so far and most likely there is a high chance that it is the theory of gravity. But then that chance does not mean anything in science, we have to keep experimenting to see whether, how long or till which limit general relativity holds. There may be a limit where it breaks down and maybe there will be some quantum effects which will become important there.
so we keep experimenting with that and then gravitational waves gives us uh, uh, gra gravitational wave observations gives us a, a tool to uh, do that carry out part of those experiments now general relativity so in of course it, as i said it takes a whole semester course to learn general relativity but uh, uh, in short uh, in wheeler's word the the gist is that space time tells matter how to move and matter tells space time how to curve i will slightly expand this uh, this part that what exactly happens here but just to say one more thing that you know it the the general relativity also predicts exotic objects like black holes uh, from which even light cannot ex uh, escape uh, that there are newtonian concepts of black hole also but then um, that's a bit different i mean there the problem that happens is that if you put a mirror the light is going to bounce back also uh, uh, at a very high speed and so on so so but event horizon that is predicted by general relativity is a, is an entirely uh, interesting concept it's mathematically beautiful and pretty interesting and also general relativity predicts gravitational waves which travel at the speed of light i'll come to that later on uh, so there is a question i will read that uh, it's from saurav upare sir uh, now dark energy survey released data saying that it is uh, smoothly uh, spread saying uh, there is a tweak in gtr needs mod modifications uh, um is it so so i i guess this refers to uh, the cosmological constant that is a lambda term which may be there uh, in uh, einstein's equation or may not be that does not uh, uh violate uh, general relativity uh, but then if uh, yeah so the w parameter uh, it basically does not have to as far as i know does not have to uh, violate uh, uh, einstein's equation there can be other theories but then here uh, you can have a you can have different kind of field for example i mean dark energy need not be done by a cosmological constant as well you can have an external fields also but this is uh, but, but this does not would not uh, i mean if there is a cosmological constant it does not disprove einstein i mean it can it, it can incorporate einstein initially did put that then said it is not there and then i think put it back something like that happened yeah uh, but then if you want a variation then you may need an external uh, a, a different field which is not exactly uh, meaning it will not be naturally uh, the dark energy would not be naturally generated by uh einstein equation lambda term does but then if you want some other complicated thing then it is not going to be you, you need to put something else okay all right so now coming back to this quest thing of what exactly happens space time tells the matter how to move and matter tells space time how to curve i will come come back to it little later when we explain gravitational waves what exactly is happening here okay so this is how i mean we will not get into the whole equations a set of equations it will take very long time to cover all this but uh, just to tell you how the whole thing comes so this is essentially einstein's equation the left hand side this g mu nu capital g mu nu term it describes the geometry of space time okay it will become again with that example it will become clearer what i mean the right hand side the, this t mu newton this the energy momentum tensor uh this describes matter uh, energy and their flows that the question which was asked about dark energy there could be a lambda term uh in this equation so let, let's say here uh which which is also called that this um, uh, cosmological constant so that you could we could add without violating this equation this equation is uh, remains valid 
But if we want something more complicated about dark energy and so on, then you, we have to add something here in this in, in this chart, a scalar field, and I mean different kinds of fields can be added here. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Uh, you can you can uh, write in the chat box. Now, what happens is that uh, when we uh, what is this, this geometry of? That's the main question. Okay, so this geometry is of a sp space time manifold. That is the thing is that, so let's say, uh, uh, in, okay, we live in three dimensions, okay, and the time is a dimension which flows. So at a given time, we are at a, at, uh, we can appreciate three dimensions. In three-dimensional world, human brain can understand the geometry of two-dimensional objects. That is, the, uh, for example, a table is flat. A table is a two-dimensional object because the, the surface, because you need two coordinates to specify the geometry of this, uh, uh, specify a point on this table. Let's say if you take a globe, okay, sphere, again, you need it's a two-dimensional surface. You need two coordinates to specify a point on this sphere. So uh, human brains cannot think about higher dimensional surfaces, even three-dimensional surfaces. That is where you need three coordinates to specify a point on a surface. We know three-dimensional volume, but not surfaces. Now for relativity, we, we need three plus one dimensional surfaces, that is three space and one time, this could be thought of as forming one surface in a higher dimensional space. The geometry of that surface is captured by this term. So it is not e possible to imagine that uh, surface, but we can, can so a lot of these algebra were developed for the two dimensional surfaces and then extended to higher dimensional. And this is, this quantity basically captures that, uh, uh, the, the properties of curvature of those surfaces. So it's meaning, uh, yeah, of, of that uh, higher dimensional surface. Now in those, that surface, you also need a quantity called uh, a metric. The, the matrix basically gives you the distance between two uh, points on that uh, surface, two nearby points. Now, in the in absence of gravitation, I think you have probably gone through this uh, general relativity lectures or anyway. But I, I just this is just to in five minutes you, you would be able to recap. So. Uh, when there is no gravitation, it is possible to get into a go to a coordinate system where the, the this metric could be described in terms of this eta mu nu, the Minkowski metric. Basically, this essentially this means that if you have to get the uh, get something called ds square, which is uh, c square dt square minus ds square minus dy square minus dz square, that construct uh, uh, th that that particular form is possible to reach with uh, when the uh, uh, when there is no gravitation. That is, the metric is basically flat. Now, when there is gravitation, it it can take any general form. Okay. However, when the gravity is weak, which I think I must I, I think you know that even on the surface of the Earth, uh, it it is not very strong. There you can write the metric as a as a flat background metric plus a small perturbation. This H mu nu is a small perturbation. That is the modulus of this is much less than one, while the diagonal components of this, the modulus of them are one. Now, if you substitute this in this equation and then define something called the trace uh, reversed uh, uh, perturbation and so on, you will get an equation of this form, okay? Now, this is actually very similar to what you get in uh, electric, uh, electromagnetic theory. So there, uh, this side basically 
gives you a source term, which is, I mean, uh, I think you, many of you have, okay, not many of you have done the wave equation, but you will do at some point because BSc students probably don't do this. Uh, you probably reach out to uh, Maxwell's equation, but then at some point you may, will probably solve it and then get this retarded uh, potential and so on. Now, uh, those, uh, so this equation can be solved in general, but the thing is that you, without doing some approximations, the solution will be kind of abstract. Now, one of the most, I mean, the trivial solution would be, uh, situation would be when you put this to be zero, that is you are in vacuum. That does not mean this is zero everywhere. This was not zero at some point, but suppose you want, you are seeking the solution at a point uh, in vacuum. Then what happens is that when you solve this equation, this box of h mean equal to zero, you get a so solution like this in the right coordinate system, which is called the transverse stressless gauge. In that gauge, you can show that you can write the metric in such a way that out of all these, out of these 16 components, 12 are zero and two of them are repeated. So only with two uh, independent components, you could describe this whole uh, perturbation. And these are the polarizations, two polarizations of gravitational waves, okay? So this is what it is. And you can see that uh, the form here, this omega t minus kz is, it comes because we have assumed the wave to be propagating another z axis to make it, all these things zero. And this is this you must have seen in any of the wave equations that they are always of this form. That is the phase becomes the same after the wave has, uh, uh, let's say propagated by a little bit of, I mean, it, it is like the, the wave nature, right? The, the, the perturbation essentially propagates at a velocity C. So at a given point, you will experience the same thing what had happened uh, C by, uh, so let's say D distance of a, C by D, D by C uh, time uh, ago and things like that. Uh, so now, uh, okay, I will come to, to, there are two questions. I will take to both, uh, both the questions. Uh, what condition does Einstein's gravitational equation, uh, same as Newton's gravitational equation? So the thing is that uh, when, um, so as you, can see Einstein's equation must, this is a good question. So I'll just explain this. These, these are done more mathematically in a course, but let's say here. So uh, essentially in the weak field limit, that when the gravitation is weak, let's say on the surface of the earth, Einstein's equation and uh, Newton's equations will give you the same result. And uh, not only on the earth, even at, a, at more stronger situations. So, um, one of the criteria for Einstein's equation was to uh, basically uh, give us the same results which I, Newton's laws give because they were very accurate to, for many of the astronomical observations. But let, rather, let me tell you where it starts differing. So for example, as you know, Mercury goes around the sun and we know exactly its uh, orbit and so on. However, because of general relativity, a correction comes. The orbit does not close completely. It starts slightly precessing. So you imagine the ellipse. So, okay, let me see if I can annotate here and then show you what is going to, what happens. Mm. Just if me a moment. Where is that? Too low. Okay, maybe I cannot do it here. Okay, so let, let me let me let me show you here just by look look at the mouse. Okay, so generally you would see like let's say that there is, this is an ellipse. Okay. So it is like elongated along this direction. So it is like moving like this. But what happens is that with 
the general relativistic correction, it does not go like this. It goes and then it does not close. So the ellipse becomes like this. So the axis of the ellipse slowly changes. This is highly exaggerated. It changes by few arc seconds in 100 years, but it slowly changes. So that's very small correction comes from general relativity. Then uh, the main correction that you see will, comes really close to compact objects like neutron stars, black holes. There the uh, gravity is strong. So there the main effect of uh, general relativity comes. Um, so the next question was, um, why are they represented as plus and cross? Well, you could call them anything because these are names, plus and cross. But as you will see that uh, there is, mm, uh, this is, these waves are quadrupolar. So this plus is, okay, I will, I will show you a picture very soon. And then you will see that the, if you see the effect of gravitational waves on a ring of particles or an array of particles, for the plus polarization, they, the motion is along is sort of like this plus, like it compresses and decompresses along these lines. Whereas for the cross polarization, it is along it is 45 degree. So the compression and the it should be called really fraction or not, uh, no, maybe uh, elongation, something like that. So those things happen along this cross axis. So you, you, we could, so this this seems like a good way to say. I mean, we could call uh, one and two, but the thing is that one thing to remember is that here the polarizations are not at 90 degrees. So it is not like uh, electromagnetic theory where this, you know, I cap and J cap you can use, like if the, uh, one polarization is along I cap, the other will be along J cap. That is not like that. This is there is a 45 degree angle. So that is where uh, the, this plus and cross also makes sense because they are at 45 degrees. So uh, the next question is that why there is a negative sign in H plus component, but not in the uh, H cross component. So this matrix, you can, this tensor basically, you can sh prove that this is a symmetric stress free uh, tensor. So, uh, so in, so when you uh, okay, so when the the mathematics tells us that uh, uh, these these are the conditions which you will get that the diagonal components, the sum of them will become zero, and here the, the tensor will other otherwise uh, will be uh, symmetric. So that's what we get. Okay. Uh, why does starting and Starting and end, uh, th those, that is that is what I am saying. That if you choose the coordinates properly, then you can make them zero. That is, uh, in this transfer stressless gauge, they become zero. It is not like any uh, very special thing. Meaning, it is it is a, still a generic uh, choice of coordinates. But there, uh, you can make uh, all these uh, components zero. That's what is happening here. The last column is zero because that is the, they are also because of the way we chose it, the Z axis is along the last column. So last row and last column. So that's how this becomes zero. And that first one is related to time. So that also we choose in such a way that it becomes zero. So the only these four components remain. Um, okay, the next question is, actually, I think people can, um, uh, it looks like people can ask the questions to everyone. So then it is better to ask the question to everyone. Otherwise, uh, other people would not be able to see it. Okay. T and R, this, this question is from, uh, so you can see the question. Are the local or global coordinates in this gauge? Uh, well, I mean, they, they are coordinates. Local meaning... Uh, 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 you can have a coordinate which is uh, local. Uh, I don't know what exactly you mean. I mean, T and R represents the whole uh, space-time coordinates. They are global coordinates. Um, okay. The next question is that um, Einstein introduced the cosmological constant to get a static universe, but now there is talk of cosmological constant to explain the accelerating universe. I, so if you put, uh, 
the lambda term, the cosmological constant term. Okay, this was the first of all. There, I believe there were lectures on uh, cosmology. This is uh, this must have been covered there. But the thing is that, um, uh, yeah, you can put cos you can put that term to cosmological constant term to exactly balance the. Uh, uh the gravitation of all the other objects in the universe so that it balances out and make it static i think it is possible but then it will be unstable but if you put cosmological uh, constant at the right amount then you would be able to explain the uh, expansion of the universe the problem is that that why exactly that um, cosmological constant will take that value because there is a fine tuning necessary from the early universe to bring it to that value which is extremely uh, 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 difficult meaning it is i think it requires some precision of one part in 10 to the 120 or something it's a, it's a crazy thing and that's why so many people are breaking their head to find, figure out that how to explain the uh, dark energy or cosmological constant and so on okay any other questions then we'll move on mm. Okay, so I, 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 just to repeat that T and R are basically global coordinates. So there is no problem there. It is here, in this, in this formula, this T and R represents the point where we are observing. But they are, uh, I mean, so I, if that is the question. Okay, so, I think huh, I will we'll now quickly go through some of the properties of gravitational waves. Uh, so as I said, these are transverse waves. They travel at the speed of light. That is actually, uh, what happens? Huh? That is fixed by this box operator. It is basically that uh, it has this form that one by C square, del square, del T square minus that nabla square. So basically that form, uh, when you put it equal to zero and solve the wave equation, it automatically make sure that the velocity is C because it comes with this one by C square del square by del T square. Okay. They have two polarization states, plus and cross. Uh, the thing is that they interact very weakly with matter. That is very uh, important. Because they interact very weakly with matter, it becomes very difficult to detect those waves. It took 100 years after Einstein predicted uh, gener uh, gravitational waves uh, to detect them. Uh, I mean, as you will see that it will be extremely tiny. But on the other hand, it is very, very useful. Because these waves interact very weakly with uh, matter, they can travel undistorted for very long distances and from, dense, from the densest parts of the universe. For example, uh, suppose there is a galaxy whose center, uh, which, which has a uh, dusty bulge and we may not be able to see inside it, if something is going on there, gravitational waves and gravitational waves are emitted, let's say a margin of uh, uh, a small black hole falling into the uh, central black hole or something like that. That will be easier to see with gravitational waves because they just uh, don't get absorbed in the dust. Then the earliest picture of the universe that we have got is, the, is the cos from the cosmic microwave background. Because before that, the universe was so dense uh, that photons were interacting very strongly with uh, electrons. So photons could not travel in a straight line for a long time. It is like, for example, if two people uh, are, uh, let's say, um, are talking to each other and somebody puts some smoke inside in between, what is going to happen is that the photons are still going to come from one person to another person, but in such a jagged path that you would not be able to create an image of the other person. So similar things were happening. But at some point, the universe became uh, uh, expanded. The temperature went down and it becomes much less dense. At that point, uh, uh, the electrons were captured by the protons and then photons could uh, travel in straight path. And the same thing, uh, so now the thing is that that happened when the universe was uh, uh, 
about four lakh years old. But if you want an earlier picture of the universe, there are two possibilities. One is neutrinos, and the other is gravitational waves. Because gravity, so there are. It is predicted that gravitational waves were generated uh, during this, uh, during the cosmic inflation. Now, uh, because gravitational waves interact very weakly with matter, and because of some more technical details, those waves may still be visible to us. Of course, that would be one of the biggest discoveries uh, if we can do it. And a lot of effort is going on to in that direction. Okay, so basically the, the, the point here is that uh, there is this fact that gravitational waves interact weakly with matter is useful for science because we can get information which is not available otherwise. But also it makes it uh, hard uh, in the sense that we need better and better detectors to do that, but which is actually easier than changing the way uh, to, to get information from uh, near the black hole, of course. Okay, so then the, there is huge worldwide effort going on to develop gravitational astronomy. As I said, it has just started. There is a long way to go. Now, this is, these are some comparison uh, between um, electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves. Basically, this will sort of clear up the uh, your. Uh, I mean, because gravitational waves are new to most people, so it's it it, it can uh, create some. Uh, 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 you you will have a better feel for with this. These are the thing is that these are not. Mathematically rigorous comparison. This was done by Keith Thorne at some point, uh, but it is it will give you some idea. So both travel in vacuum. It's basically, they, they don't need any specific medium. Generally, when we talk about electromagnetic waves, we talk about incoherent superposition of uh, uh, photons coming from atoms and molecules. So basically, like any light source, you will know that there are a lot of atoms are emitting them, but you don't know which one is doing when and so on. So it's like always a incoherent superposition. But when we are talking about gravitational waves, especially from the binaries or spinning neutron stars, you will see that this is one source emitting the whole wave. So there is a clear difference. Then uh, the resolution, when we talk about electromagnetic waves, we are talking about essentially uh, uh, much smaller wavelength, okay, the, like angstroms and so on. But gravitational waves, the, the ones which have been detected are have thousand kilometer uh, long, uh, uh, wavelength. Basically at 100 hertz, it, it's like 3000 kilometers and so on. So, but then that does not mean that gravitational waves do not, cannot have small frequencies, uh, small wavelengths, large frequencies, or the other way around. So all, all these waves, electromagnetic and gravitational waves, both exist in uh, every frequency band. But typically when we talk about, we are referring to uh, these different uh, wavelength scales. So, uh, and then electromagnetic waves are much easily absorbed, scattered, and dispersed by matter, like that you are looking at the screen right now, show proves that, because you can, your eye can easily interact with the photon and then uh, process it. But that if you uh, wave your hand in front of your, uh, keeping your eyes closed, by sensing the gravitational waves from your hand, your brain cannot say that, you were moving your hand or somebody else was uh, moving their uh, hands. So, so that is the difference. Uh, gravitation, the, the overall gravitational interactions is, is very uh, uh, weak. Okay, and again, the frequency which we are talking about is uh, much higher for electromagnetic waves and lower for gravitational waves. And now, okay, so I did not mention about the resolution part. The thing is that because when the wavelength is large, and frequency uh, is small, the resolution automatically goes down. This is basically the Rayleigh criteria sort of thing that the resolution is given by, uh, it goes as one by lambda. So if, the, if lambda is high, then the resolution automatically goes down. Now generally for electromagnetic waves, we typically measure uh, power, uh, sometimes amplitude, but for gravitational waves, we always may, so far we have been measuring amplitude, not the power. Okay, even though uh, there, there are stochastic background where we will be able to uh, measure uh, uh, power. Uh, so, so basically, as I said, again, these comparisons are typical comparison. It does not mean that this, there is the other possibility is not there. And accept, so basically the, again, the detectors are generally directional for electromagnetic waves, like when you, 
you have a telescope, you are looking at a given direction. But of course, there are also dipole antennas which look at all the directions at the same time. So gravitational wave detectors, but it is very difficult, uh, probably will be impossible to make a directional antenna. Uh, it, it will always point, uh, get uh, uh, source uh, signals from every direction. Okay. Okay. Any, um, okay, before we move there, any questions here? So, as I said, actually, there is no reason to believe that gravitational waves only have uh, frequencies less than uh, 10 to the 4 hertz. Typically, when we talk about gravitational waves, it is these frequencies. Like we, when two black holes are merging, their frequency is typically, let's say, around 100 hertz. But then the gravitational waves can exist at higher frequencies. The sources are not yet known, and uh, sources in the sense that strong gravitational waves. There can be gravitational waves at any frequency, yes, again, a high frequency also. So, but just that uh, they, they, we, we don't know yet a strong source there. So this is, again, typical comparison. It's not, uh, I mean, and electromagnetic waves can also exist at, uh, at frequencies lower than 10 to the 4 hertz. So there is no problem. Okay, now coming back to the uh, most promising source of gravitational waves, are compact binary coalescence. That is two uh, compact stars like uh, neutron stars, black holes, and for uh, future detectors, space-based detectors, even white dwarfs, they can go around and merge. So now I will come back to that uh, space-time analogy that, uh, that, you know, that Wheeler's comment, which I said that space-time tells uh, matter uh, how to move and matter tells by space-time how to curve. So let's come back to that. And so let me, I think it will be better if I turn on the video. Okay. So what happens here is that, okay, I cannot see my video, but then I think you can see. Um, maybe we can see from here. Okay. Assuming that you can see my video, I'm just going ahead with this. So what happens is that suppose you have a plain sheet of uh, a rubber sheet, okay? And you put a heavy ball there. Rubber sheet bends and you have seen that. Uh -oh. Video is not visible. Wait, one second, let me stop this share and then try. Oh, it is visible? Okay, fine. All right. Ah, yeah, I can see it now. All right. So what happens is that suppose you take this flat surface and you put a heavy ball there, then it, it is going to curve like this, right? I mean, you have seen this picture many times in sci-fi uh, movies and so on. Now, what happens is that if you take a very small ball bearing, and roll it in that surface, it's going to go around and fall at some point. Now, here what happened is that this heavy ball at the uh, on this rubber sheet, so this is like matter, is telling this rubber sheet, which is like space time, how to bend. And the rubber sheet then is telling this small ball bearing how to move. Now, in general, it is more complicated because the here we the, the matter which is curving the space time and the matter which is being moved by the space time were different. But in general, they will be the same. They, they could be the same set of objects. So now let's say there are two balls, okay, which are on this rubber sheet. What is going to happen is that they are going to go around like this. Okay. Now here, every object, one of this, these two are almost let's say equal mass. Then each object is going to change the um, geometry on, of this surface, which is going to influence the motion of the other object. And then this other object is also going to change 
the geometry, the first object is experiencing. So in some sense, the first object through the second object is influencing its own motion. So that's how this whole thing becomes very non-linear. But anyway, in general, what so that, and it becomes very difficult to solve. That's why you need numerical relativity and so on, especially when the objects are very close and moving at very high speeds. So in general, what happens is that when these objects are going around, they are emitting gravitational waves, because of which they are losing energy. To compensate for that lost energy, they have to come a bit closer. As you know, like for when electrons uh, uh, emit a photon, then they move to the lower orbits, very similar. Now, when they come closer, it, the, the, uh, the period in, uh, reduces, that is the frequency increases. And that is basically like saying that the inner planets have smaller period. So they start moving even at even a faster rate, okay? So then what happens is that they start emitting gravitational waves at an even faster rate. So this is a runaway process. So as they come closer and closer, they start emitting gravitational waves at an extremely fast rate. And also the frequency increases, this wavelength reduces. So that is what is shown in this plot. Okay, now you don't have to see my face. I will just stop the video and you come back to this. Now you see that here, the this is typical, uh, uh, waveform that the wave wavelength is reducing, that is frequency increasing, and also see the amplitude increasing. These sort of waveforms are called chirp waveforms. Okay, and then uh, there is this phase when they actually merge. It becomes very complicated, and it has to be solved by uh, uh, numerical relativity. And then finally, it rings down. See, a lot of work at this part, the spiral and ring down, were done in India, uh, for which was doable analytically and now even numerical relativity has started uh, in India. Okay, now let us see there are two questions. Now there is one question and somebody raised a uh, hand I think but I cannot see it anymore. Okay, the question here is that why GWs are only transfers? Can there be longitudinal os oscillations of space time? No, this is just uh, from the when you uh, solve the mathematics, then you see that it is transverse. I mean, you can go to a different coordinate system where may, it may appear not transverse, but yeah, it is uh, it, it is transverse, essentially. Uh, I mean, you could ask the same question about, uh, let's say, electromagnetic waves and why it is transverse. I mean, the, the, when you solve it, you, you see that it is transverse. Or why the sound, sound wave is not transverse. This is coming from the physics. Okay, then the mm, ah okay. So I think uh, so now the point is that if you see the typical estimates of the amplitudes. Okay, we will we started a bit late, so I will uh, wrap up in uh, maybe in five minutes. So uh, if you see, look at this uh, estimate of what will be the. Uh, amplitude of gravitational waves that is received from an object which is, let's say, far away. If the period is like one hour and they are like two solar mass, it's like basically two, one solar mass object like the mass of the sun, they are going around. The amplitude is 10 to the minus 21 when it is one kilo per sec away, which is very close. It is basically in our galaxy. We don't see a binary merger in our galaxy. This is like basically in spiral, something is going around, but not meaning this phase, not really coming close to the margin. This is the part when the signal becomes much stronger. And suppose when they're very close, so the period is 10 milliseconds, that is like uh, 100 Hertz. Okay, this is where typically we detect. And let's say these are like neutrons, two neutron stars, 1.4 into two. And if it is, even it is, if it is one mega per sec away, actually it is far, even further away, the amplitude is 10 to the minus 22. So these are like very small uh, amplitudes. A strain amplitude of 10 to the minus minus 22 means that if you have a detector of length L, it has to be multiplied by this number. So even if it is kilometers, the this number will come to like 10 to the minus 18 meters. So which is sort of, uh, which is smaller than the size of a proton. But we'll come to that later on, that how exactly it is they are detected and so on. So this is one of these animations which show what exactly happens. They, again, I, I already described that the 
objects initially as they go around the frequency increases you will see that the, and the period uh, the wavelength reduces uh, yeah wavelength reduces and then the last few cycle it becomes extremely fast they come close to the let's say half the velocity of light this is so fast and these are also very dense objects they emit enormous amount of energy okay so there are other sources of gravitational waves also basically anything that moves asymmetrically uh, creates gravitational waves if if a sphere perfect sphere is spinning about its uh, one of the uh, axis that is going through the center then no gravitation waves will be emitted but if there is a deformation if there are any deformations on the sphere then there will be gravitational wave emission basically the quadrupole moment mass quadrupole moment has to change i mean the equation i showed if you solve that equation uh, you will get something like this uh, in general when there is a, there is a source that the there will be a, a mass quadrupole change and then it will be retarded that is what we see here uh, is the effect of some something that happened r by c time ago which makes sense suppose there is a source at r distance away it it took r by c time to for the for the uh, for the information to come to us and there are so there are different kinds of sources the, the compact binary coalescence that we discussed is the is a primary source but then there are other sources like i said uh, uh, the that when things are moving with little bit of deformation like these pulsars magnetars etc nothing none of these have been detected by the way so those who are going to do gravitational wave astronomy these are the things to look forward to that one has to detect them at some point and then there are these stochastic sources as i i mentioned that you know there were this uh, uh, gravitational waves which were generated in the early universe like the cosmic microwave background and that the detection of them will be very important it is like uh, uh it, it will be one of those uh, observational proof of uh, cosmic inflation we don't have yet any but cosmic inflation has been put by hand because otherwise we cannot explain the observations it is so important uh and then also stochastic background can be created by collection of all the above like, let's say that there is a cluster of galaxies where many binary mergers are going on we cannot identify each one of them but then we can see that there is a some some power coming from that direction this is what is hap what happens for any astronomical objects right we don't know which atom is emitting when but generally it feels bright okay so uh, i'll come to the questions but uh, let's let with the, i have two more slides which will which we will finish so this is the frequency band and as i said in many frequencies gravitational waves can ex exist even though we don't have any clear astronomical source at higher frequencies and so on so far what is detected are in this range about 100 hertz basically in the ligo detectors operate in the audible range so sort of we are here and we have only detected neutron star neutron star and black hole black hole coalescences so far but then if we want to go to uh, want to detect bigger black holes then we have to go to lower frequencies because bigger black holes uh, uh, have larger radius and then they uh, Uh, march at a lower frequency because of that i mean you can see from kepler's law that's what happens uh and uh, th there is a so i will talk about lisa that is the space mission uh, later on so this and then so th there are there are many things to do now we'll end with this uh, slide which you can may think a bit uh, thought provoking so let's see this is uh, th this is the the left hand side is about electromagnetic astronomy right hand side is about gravitational wave astronomy uh basically the point here is to say that we are detecting a tip of the iceberg so far so here is that analogy that these are the planets which galileo saw and we are kind of at that stage the so some of the sources we have detected so far okay now after that there are this whole bunch of things which we have detected in electromagnetic astronomy okay and i could directly say that in gravitational wave astronomy also we are probably going to detect all this but then people may say that well uh, these have already been detected i mean there is nothing new there but if you look at the composition of the universe uh, that 70% of the of its component is dark energy and about uh, let's say one fourth of it is dark matter and we have no clue about this 
we don't know we, we have not detected them physically these are all postulated because otherwise we cannot explain the data now with this situation it will be very difficult to believe that we have seen everything in the universe except for this so i would think that there are there will be many surprises which would come from gravitational astronomy it may be it only time will tell us whether that is right or not but uh, but at even if we don't detect anything that will be also something interesting to say that okay there is nothing missing here we at least know that we are not missing any news any, any other sources everything has been covered but then astronomy uh, uh, does progresses by questioning the existence uh, questioning the present knowledge and i think that is what how it will uh, go on okay i i will stop here now uh, the next lecture will be more on the detectors now we'll come back to the questions okay why not in uh, earth and sun pair earth will emit gravitational and lewis energy and eventually fall into the sun exactly that is what is going to happen but the emission of gravitational wave energy for the earth is very small but you can actually calculate this energy and see how how much time it is going to take uh, for the earth to fall in the sun that will be something interesting uh, to do uh so uh another question actually oh, okay so this i see that some some people are not asking the questions to everyone so the problem is that they have to read it okay oswin george's question uh, uh what is the magnitude of strength created by the gravitational waves of uh, from pulsars okay there is a debate on that um, so far so if the pulsars had a small deformity let's say even if it was one part in a million that is the deformity is like this so if you take the moment of inertia along x axis y axis and z axis and if you uh, define something which sort of describes the asymmetry that i y y minus i x x by i z z something like that even if it was one part in million we would have detected so it is so we are we have put an upper limit saying that it is certainly less than that sort of i mean again there are all kinds of issues there uh, so the amplitude also depends on the distance now we can i think we can very confidently say that the from the galactic uh, neutron stars uh, uh, pulsars the mm, amplitude is less than 10 to the minus 25 we have to check the exact number but it will be of that sort of order uh, okay there is a hand up so i will unmute pralay uh, uh, yes yeah yes sir thank you sir for very nice presentation it was really a lot of comparative comparison as well as informative so i have a, a simple questions Uh, you mentioned that anything that moves asymmetrically creates gravitational waves right yes that is right and uh, and this is well known that any material object which moves that creates again matter waves uh yes matter waves mm -hmm. deep waves yeah. yeah yeah so i would like to know uh, first of all uh, any correlation can you correlate the two waves and second object is the uh, object which is moving if it is spinning or non spinning so whether whether there will be any effect on the uh, emitted waves both matter wave as well as uh, gravitational wave so effect yes. of spin on the waves and uh, first point was the correlation between gravitational waves and matter waves right so 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 the okay the first point is about the spin so if the black holes are spinning versus non spinning the wave uh, uh, the gravitational wave emission changes and that is why we could actually put some constraints uh, uh, in fact i mean it is like a measurement on the spin of the black holes so spin does change the uh, uh, gravitational wave uh, emission but coming back to your uh, other question so the effect which we are studying is um, 
So when the mass quadrupole moment changes, you get gravitational wave. Now, when a mass moves, you any any massive body move, you are basically saying that that it, it will be it will have a groove velocity sort of situation. But even then, if you calculate the mass quadrupole moment, I guess you will get the same result, right? Because the the mass energy that that you have to integrate over all the frequencies. Right, right. So then I guess you are going to get the same result because the group velocity is going to give you the ultimate uh, motion of the uh, motion, I mean, the macroscopic motion of the object. Right. So effectively, you should get the same result. I don't know whether anyone okay. actually checked the, the real microscopic properties, um, what is going to happen, but I guess this is broadly the situation. Yeah. Yes, sir, sir, may I add one more little? Yeah, sure. One question. So regarding some matter waves, so it is uh, found that uh, solitary waves, solitons exist for corresponding to matter waves. That is, solitary waves are there for even for matter waves. So for gravitational waves, which are ripples in space time. So can you imagine that type of structures, I, I nonlinear think, quadrant uh, structures? I, I, yeah. Okay, you have to look up the literature. I cannot say uh, exactly okay. the situation. Okay. No, thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank yeah. you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. There are questions, uh, more questions. Uh, huh. Okay. Mm. So there are questions about how to do uh, projects on gravitational waves. I'll come back to that. Mm. Okay. Let me see. Okay. A gravitational waves is oscillation in vacuum space time. That is a four dimensional surface. Uh, is it a signature of fifth dimension into which the oscillation is happening? No, it is not. Mm, it is. It is still uh, the flat oscillations can happen in four dimensions. So, okay. So, to give you an example, um, uh, okay. Let's say that. Uh, uh, yeah. So let's let us consider only the two-dimensional surface. Okay. So the surface, let's say, is bending like it is becoming a sphere and it can also bend like a saddle, okay? In that case, suppose there is an ant on this two-dimensional surface, the ant would be able to figure out that this surface, the two-dimensional surface has changed its curvature from uh, uh, the positive curvature is like a sphere to the negative curvature, which is a saddle, by drawing a triangle and adding the sum of the angles of the triangle, which would not remain 180 degree, which would be uh, more than 180 degree for positive curvature and less than 180 degree for negative curvature. And the same thing can happen. Similar measurement could be done by drawing a circle, for example, on the uh, on a uh, flat surface, the ratio of the uh, circumference to the radius would be uh, 2 pi, but on curved surfaces, it will be different. Okay. Mm. Okay, unique. You, uh, I will unmute. Uh, sir, hello, am I audible? Yes. Uh, sir, actually, I have a question which is a little bit different from this context. So, the Hawkins and the Penrose diagrams of a black hole. That defines the uh, actually the this question is related to some some instance of black hole information paradox. Those uh, Hawkins and Penrose diagrams of a black hole that defines something of a wormhole and towards uh, the information passes through it to a different phase. So how will we define these diagrams in context of the merger phase? While two black holes merger, how will we define these diagrams of that particular phase? Is there a possible way to do that? People have done this. I mean, there is uh, what is uh, so what exactly is the problem? Like you can. Uh, well, I mean, you can look it up, right? I mean, there, there, there are uh, uh, there are null infinity and so on. All these things have been captured. What, what exactly is uh, you want to put a wormhole, etc.? Then I don't know how to do that. I mean, how will we define the diagram when two black holes will merge? Those passage of information from one phase to another phase, and in that way. I think they are there. I mean, I, they are there in literature. I can we, 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 I can send you uh, the link, or you can just. I mean, you can just do a Google search. I think you will get it. Uh, so let me let me just try right away. Uh, so so do Penrose 
diagram for i think uh, if you know there are people in at ayuka who are working on this thing uh, so Okay, I'll just uh, send. I just got one right away, so I will, I can send you there. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it is there. Okay. No, this is this is about quantum and all those things are also related. Um, yeah. Okay. So I I will send you. I mean, it is that there are people who are working on the, those things that Ayuka also. Salag and so on. They okay. 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 So the question now about the, uh, uh, the about projects. Now the thing is that um, there there are of course people who offer projects at Ayuka. That is there is no. Uh, so there there are many people who do that. But if you want to do a summer project, then the then it becomes um, complicated because uh, there is a full procedure and then because of the pandemic we could not uh, invite people at ayuka for msc projects things uh, again become a bit difficult because without accommodation it becomes difficult to do a project all remote projects are possible but then it gets uh, difficult but i would say that you the best way would be to write to someone and see if a project possibility exists these days things are complicated but then on the other hand it is still uh, the, the advantage here is that you can do remote project as well so that is the general advice and then you can write to people i think either the person will accept or may redirect to somebody uh, not many people may not even re reply in that case you can write to another person and so on okay now okay this is the last question we tackled gravity as a geometric curvature of space time but in case of linearized theory we are using approximation and treating gravity as a propagating field in fixed background is there a way to treat it uh, geometrically also uh, uh, yeah i mean you can do it i mean we are doing it uh, just be just because we want to simplify the mathematics if you want you can actually treat the whole thing Uh, so uh, in numerical relativity of course it gets much more uh, they are much more coupled i mean you, when you are solving really when the black holes are merging then you have to uh, uh, you cannot separate it because the uh, system is highly curved there and you have to extract the gravitational wave information also from the uh, from your simulation results so those things do get uh, uh, i mean you, you the formalism is very general but why would you do that that is the question that if you if you are really interested in knowing what is happening at the earth because of the gravitational waves you would not uh, 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 <laughs> i mean get into that complication because their mathematical mathematics is already pretty complicated um okay there is one more question that is there any exchange of gravitons when the gravitational waves travel through the space time and what will be the interferometer okay so the first question is that well you can have a graviton so even though gravitational gravitation is not yet quantized you can have gravitational gravitons you can well, uh, imagine that there are gravitons uh, but just that the number will be very large at that point uh, like for example the uh, uh, waves which have been detected they correspond to very high energy emissions and at there the uh, number of uh, gravitons will be so large that it will basically behave classically uh, so i don't know exactly what, i mean if there will be any advantage of getting into gravitons and will there be interference between gravitational waves yeah there will be interference between two gravitational waves and there are uh, right now the probability of detecting two gravitational waves together is very low but then at some point when the detectors uh, we have much higher sensitivity and also for space based detectors where which are going to look at very long duration signals uh, meaning the frequency will be much lower there there will be a interference and it will be just like uh, interference in for for any other waves it will be sum of uh, the superposition of the amplitudes with phase meaning 
not the power but the amplitudes power also you can add actually that is also possible but then uh, you will get more information if you use the phase okay mm. what is the evidence of dark matter and dark energy how scientists have proved their existence okay the only ex so there is no direct laboratory evidence of dark matter or dark energy it is only that without this we cannot explain the data uh, the observations and several observations meaning like there are different observations like galaxy rotation curves uh, the, these things must have been covered in the school also then there is cosmic microwave background observations all those things if you want to explain you need to assume that there is about uh, uh 25% of the universe more than 25% of the universe has is dark matter and more than 68% is dark energy this this has to be put by hand there is no direct evidence but people are all kinds of experiments are going on to detect them or or characterize them acha prolay do you have another question let me unmute your hand is still up no oh, oh sorry 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 oh, no, sorry, sorry sir okay i totally okay, thank you thank so, you sir thank okay you. so we stop here now and tomorrow we will start with uh, uh, detectors okay yeah okay bye thank you sir